Hi, my name is David Douglas. I'm from Scotland. I've come here to the Northwest, the year is 1825, and uh, I'm here to collect and observe the plants that grow in this part of the country. Uh, the Columbia region is new to us in England, and we hope to colonize this someday. And one of the things that we wanna know is what grows here. Uh, some of these plants will be shipped back to England uh, to be planted in gardens because they're just beautiful plants. Others of these plants may have a commercial use. Uh, they might be turned into foodstuffs or crops. Uh, still others might make interesting dyes. And there are uses for all of these, including medicine. So today, what I'd like to do is take you for a short walk. I'll tell you the plants that are here in my time and maybe even look into the future a bit to see ones that'll be coming down uh, as we colonize this place. Uh, more and more animals will be brought from Europe and those animals on their skins and hides and furs and wool really will have seeds and uh, they may start colonizations of plants here as well as people. One of the first that I saw when I came through this area was this dwarf sunflower. This is a native of our area and like the sunflowers you're used to, it will have small seeds. Those seeds are uh, choice seeds used by all sorts of small animals from mice all the way up to uh, larger animals like rabbits. The uh, natives like the roots from these things. They'll take the roots and uh, boil them up and use them for a, a soap product. This, the roots do contain some soapy uh, materials and so they can keep clean with that. I think this would make an interesting garden plant back in England too. What do you think? Being American, you probably know this. Your American adventurers, Lewis and Clark, found out about this when they were on the Lower Tushi River back in 1806. On their way home, they were coming up the river with the horses that they had traded from the Indians. And uh, in the morning when they gathered up the horses, they found some of them were sick and they couldn't understand why. And they looked around and what they found were a lot of small green plants that were growing. And uh, they weren't too familiar with it. Uh, but now we know that that small green plant was probably poison hemlock. And this is the poison hemlock that they talk about. Uh, Socrates found out the hard way you don't want to drink this stuff. Uh, it's one of the poisonous plants that we have here in this valley. And if you look on the stems, you'll see purple blotches, which gives it its name. Conium, so you can recognize it, and perpia for the purple blotches. You can recognize it by the purple blotches on the stem. Poison hemlock, you wanna avoid that one. This is white amaranth. White amaranth is also grown in gardens. Uh, it's one of those plants that if I was to pull it up, you'd see it has a bright red root. And one of the things about it is that uh, you use the seeds, which are almost ready, but not quite, and you can make bread from it crunch them up like flour and make amaranth bread. Uh, you can still buy that at groceries and bakeries here in town. Uh, it has some health benefits, which is one of the reasons that people grew it. But it got out of cultivation and now it pops up here and there and everywhere. In a pinch, the burdock, the one with the large leaf, makes an acceptable headdress. You can put it on your head and it'll shed water. So if you lose your hat, and you don't have time to weave one. Uh, burdock leaves are good for that. The other nice thing about burdock is that if you were to dig this out, you'd find it has a nice parsnip-like root on it. And uh, if you boil that up, it's kind of bitter if you eat it raw. But you boil it up once and discard water and the root is edible. The way people like to do it best is boil it once, get rid of the bitterness, cut it into rounds like small carrot rounds, and then fry it. And it makes an excellent meal. Good for your head, good for your tummy. Another abundant plant that was brought over by some of our settlers, planted in the gardens, makes a good green, goes well with your meat at a meal. Uh, but it got out of hand and it's growing everywhere now. This is called lamb's quarters. And to this very day, 
uh, people that are walking around and hiking, if they get hungry, you can take some of the leaves, eat them, and they're delicious. Go ahead and try some, but make sure you get the right one. You might take a closer look at this one, too. Your Captain Lewis, the American explorer, identified this at the mouth of the Walla Walla River, and uh, turns out it's quite abundant in this area. If you look closely, you can see a very sharp thorn, and that gives the name to this bush, which is black hawthorn, uh, Cretaceous Douglasii. You'll never guess who they named it after. And uh, those thorns were used by the natives. You can make a type of fish hook out of them. Uh, the berries are edible, and it's related to apples. So in the fall, you can crush these up, separate the seeds out, make a sort of applesauce, and it's very, very good. Uh, it also is a very hard, dense wood, and one of the better ones for running a forge. If you have no coal and you want to uh, get your metal good and hot, this is the type of wood that you would use to do it. Black hawthorn. Aha. We're lucky enough. If we can beat the, the bees and other animals to these, these are trailing blackberries. And the trailing blackberries are highly edible, highly desirable, except they have a lot of thorns on them. You have to be careful picking them. Uh, the natives would take these and crush them and dry them into sheets. On uh, October 18th of 1805, as your Captain Lewis and Captain Clark were making their way to the Pacific Ocean, uh, they camped uh, very close to Walla Walla, Fort, what is now Fort Walla Walla. And uh, the Indian chief Yellup brought down a couple of cakes of these and gave them to the explorers as a gift. In return, they gave him a peace medal, but you can't eat a peace medal and these sure are good. Another interesting plant is called smooth sumac. Uh, Captain Lewis called it shumac. Uh, you might have guessed that I have a copy of his journals and uh, kind of see what he said about the plant life that was here uh, before I arrived. He listed this as one of the plants that grow in this area and it makes a nice ornamental shrub uh, in gardens. It makes a, a canopy of shade for plants that don't like the open sunlight. And so many people in uh, England that grow gardens and eventually here in colonial America, they will do the same thing. So the sumac will become a very important plant. Later on, you can see the beginnings of it right here. It will have a nice flower uh, bud to it. And if you wait until it turns bright red, uh, you can take that, put it in a, a kettle with some water, set it in the sun for a few hours, and then strain it through a cloth and you will get an excellent substitute lemonade. Uh, it's high in citrus, vitamin C, all sorts of good things, and uh, is definitely one of those plants that we welcome in our gardens. We know that we're in a swampy or riparian type habitat when we find these sword ferns growing. Uh, they like moist areas. Uh, they generally avoid open sunlight. Beautiful plant. You find these in gardens all over England as well. One of the interesting things about these ferns, they don't just turn brown and die at the end of the season. They'll turn bright yellow too, just like some of the deciduous trees. And that bright yellow is a contrast to all the other greens and browns that live in the forest here. Uh, the other useful thing about this plant is that when it first grows, it makes a little fiddle, a little curly fiddle, and they're edible. You want to be careful not to eat too many. Uh, they can cause a stomach upset, but a few of them in a salad, they're very good.
you can take a look at the creek here. This is Garrison Creek, uh, appropriate for a fort, Garrison Creek. But what I want you to look at here are those plants down here that are shaped like this, like an arrow. And you can see there's some bright green ones. There's one sitting over there. Looks almost like an animal with two ears coming off the back. That's Wapato. And Wapato was one of the main food sources for our Native Americans here, still is. Wapato grows only in swampy areas, sometimes inundated with water, sometimes usually much more like what you see here. The way it was harvested is the Indian ladies would take a canoe and they would go out into the swampy areas and hang on to the gunnels of the canoe and dig those up with their feet. And when they released them, they would float up. You could cut the stem off to the root in the canoe and you could gather wapato all day long. It's also called a duck potato and it has a very starchy root. Uh, Captain Clark uh, was very fond of these. He liked to have them with his deer meat and such. And uh, when he was at the Indian village at Sandy River, uh, he wanted to trade the, for the Indians to get some of these and they wouldn't trade. So he had to resort to some American skullduggery and he pulled a couple of magic tricks, including lighting a, a match in one of their fireplaces and it burst into flames and it kind of scared them and they were intimidated into giving him the wapato that he wanted. Uh, here, we just trade with them. And the Indians are now uh, more than eager to trade with us for the things that we have to trade to them. But this is a plant that uh, is not common everywhere anymore, but it once was. And at least it's growing here where you can see it. Blue elderberry, uh, one of the most prolific plants in our area, and certainly a native. Uh, it likes riparian habitats because it likes damp roots, but the wood is soft almost pithy. Uh, it's one of the things that can be used to start a fire with a hand drill or a bow drill. Uh, the berries themselves are totally edible and delicious. In the fall, when the leaves begin to come off, they're easy to find. And you have these beautiful, almost semi-frozen blueberries and they're cold and they're juicy and they're sweet. And if you were to take some of the corn that uh, we got at the fort and you parch that corn and it's salty, and it's crunchy and it's delicious. And you put both of them together and in your mouth at the same time. And you get warm and hot and you get salty and sweet and you get juicy and crunchy and it's delicious. So it's one of those foods that people like. Another use for it, back at the fort, we have a cook who's particularly fond of elderberry wine. And he'll collect this and he'll make up elderberry wine. He cooks with it, he says, but I think a lot of it goes just to him personally. Blue elderberries are common here. Another interesting plant who's not really showing you how he's supposed to look. This is a very tall plant. And look at the nice willowy leaves on that. They're filled with fluorescence. Uh, this is nature's <coughs> natural toilet paper. It's also called great mullen. And the great mullen, when those flowers come on like that, you can take that top and boil it. Uh, you can salt and butter it and eat it almost like corn on the cob. The plant leaves themselves, uh, you can dry them and smoke them. Uh, they contain some uh, bronchodilators. And when people have trouble breathing, believe it or not, they can smoke some of that and it helps open up their uh, bronchus and makes them breathe better. Who ever thought that smoking would be good for you? All right, Pine Cove, you said your last goodbye. You may wonder what a botanist needs with a gun. Well, let me tell you, there's a couple of things that I use this gun for. One is to put food on the table. One is to protect myself from grizzlies and such. And another one is as a scientific instrument. Now, you don't often think of a weapon that way, but I was down in the Umpqua country in October of 1826, and an Indian had told me about a tree that grew twice as tall as any other tree in the forest. Well, that's quite a story. If you look behind me, you'll see some ponderosa pine and they can grow to 150 feet tall. Imagine a tree that's twice as tall as that. 
Well, as a botanist, I couldn't pass that up. So some of the Hudson Bay fellows, they just said that they would go hunting down in that country and they let me tag along. And the further south we got, the more I heard about these trees and yet I had not seen one. Well, I was about ready to give up and turn back when one morning I got up and went out for a walk to the crest of a hill. And as I got to the top of the hill, I looked down and there was one of those trees. And by golly, it was twice as tall as any ponderosa pine around it. I was amazed. I hiked down there. I looked up at that tree. I mean, you can imagine, I've got to have some of those pine cones. Well, those pine cones are 300 feet in the air. And there's no way that you can climb a tree that's 60 feet around and has no limbs on the bottom half. So how do you get those down? Well, that's where you load up your scientific instrument and you take careful aim and bang, I shot a pine cone and it came tumbling to the ground. I loaded up, bang, shot another one. Loaded up, bang, shot another one. I'm a good shot. Fourth time I was loading up and I looked up and there were eight Umpqua Indians, all of them in red and black face paint and they were not looking happy. And so now I'm a little nervous. I had my gun loaded. I had a pistol at that time. I had two shots in that. I had the tomahawk in my back and I had my knife at my side. One, two, three, four, five. If I'm lucky, I get five. There's still three left. I knew I was in deep trouble. And so they asked me what I was doing. And I told them I was taking, collecting uh, pine cones. And I picked one up and showed them what I was after. And then I got an idea. I said, I want pine cones. You bring to me. And they looked at each other. I said, I give you tobacco. And they agreed. And the eight of them ran into the woods to try and find some pine cones for me. And when they were gone, I picked up my pine cones and got the heck out of there. I wasn't going to stick around and wait to, to negotiate with them. So I got my pine cones. But when I got them back to England, uh, they weren't viable. They didn't sprout. Eventually, we got some sugar pine in England, but it never did well. Yeah, it's just not the right climate for it. And it only grows in that small area. And Northern California and uh, Southern Oregon, but it was one of the finest trees I've ever seen. They named Douglas firs after me, but I wish they had named that sugar pine after me instead. One of the things you've seen me carrying around, it's made out of metal and it's very heavy and you probably wondered why I was carrying it. This is called a vasculum. Uh, most botanists carry such a thing. And one of the reasons is that I keep a few odds and ends in here. Uh, I'll show you what's in here. Right now I carry my lunch. There's uh, uh, some company biscuits and odds and ends. I have a small fire starting kit and uh, my seed collection material. I carry these kind of things with me because if I find a plant that has seeds that I need, well, how do I get those back to England? Well, this is how I do it. If you look, it looks like a honeycomb, but there are little tubes of paper in here. And on those little tubes of paper, I can write down where I got the seed, uh, the date, the time, the location, and so on. And once I've got the seed stored in there, I fold the end over like that. And then I can put this in a tightly sealed metal can, and I can send this back to England. And it's going to take at least nine or ten months to get there. And so this is protected from sea weather and insects and things of that sort. But the real use for the vasculum is if I'm out like I was today and I find a plant that I want to bring back and keep the roots wet and the plant leaves moist, uh, I can put it in here with some damp rags and I can carry that back to uh, my camp and then redo that and package it up for shipping to England. So this vasculum has many uses. One of the favorite uses for me is to carry my tea. Uh, my tea is in blocks like this and like I've always said, tea is the monarch of all foods. So I can cut that up, put it in my cup, set the cup over the fire and have a nice cup of tea for the evening meal. And that's why I carry that thing everywhere I go. I also have a spare pencil. I have my notebook in my bag. I even have a press board in there so that if I do find uh, interesting specimens for the botanist back in England to study, uh, all I have to do is take that, press it, send it back to them, and 
away we go. One thing about a frontier botanist, you never travel late. Well, I appreciate you joining me this afternoon. Uh, there are some fascinating plants, especially in your part of the world up here. But I've got to be back at the fort by dark, and it's 30 miles of rough riding from here to there. So I'm going to head back and hopefully uh, keep on heading down the river till I get to Fort Vancouver and uh, catch the September ship home. I'm glad you could join me, and maybe you can stop down at the fort one day, and I'll treat you to a good hike. Up there. A few questions here. So, there. Am I on now? So Nadine Baldridge asked, uh, "How is this sumac different looking from poison sumac?" Well, when I was back east in 1823, I had an opportunity to see some sumac uh, that was of the poisonous variety. Out here in the northwest, we hardly ever see poisonous sumac, and. Uh, they look similar, except that our local smooth sumac uh, has the large cones, whereas the poison sumac has a more rounded and a, a much redder uh, cone. Uh, the leaves on the poisonous sumac are shinier than the ones on our smooth sumac. And that's because of the oil that's in it that uh, if you brush against it and get it on you, uh, it, will, uh, be, it will cause a rash. It will be very itchy. Okay, and other questions here too. There's another question. Can you discuss a little more about the seasonal cycle of native food plant use? Well, the seasonal cycle follows pretty much the, the plant succession itself. Uh, in other words, in January, uh, you're not going to find a whole lot growing around here. Uh, January is a good month to collect red osier dogwood. Uh, it stands out against the white snow. Uh, it has a red bark and it was often used as uh, a tobacco substitute. You get into February, uh, that was called the hunger moon for good reason. Uh, most of the food stores have uh, just about been used up and very few things are growing. By the time you get into March and April, uh, the grass is growing, it's good browsing for the, or good grazing for the horses. And uh, we also see the beginning of biscuit roots, lomatiums and other plants that can be used for root foods. Uh, by the time you get into uh, May, June, July, rose hips are coming on, uh, camas roots are ripening up, uh, berries are starting to come on, especially uh, in June, the gooseberries, Umatilla uh, gooseberries that we have here. And the, the seasons progress like that. So you follow them. And uh, being nomadic, you went where the food was. Uh, at some times you could be collecting camas and hunting for deer, uh, other times, you weren't going to find much camas, but maybe the deer were still abundant. So there was a cyclical nature to the collection of food. Uh, today, we, we can go to a grocery store, say in downtown Glasgow, and we can get what we need. But in those days, there were no grocery stores anywhere near here. And so you had to go around, follow the seasons, and collect the food as best you could. They're not going to believe this in Glasgow, by the way. <laughs> are, are the plants here or in Glasgow? Are, are the plants here? Yeah. I, I missed the question. Are the plants better here or in Glasgow? What, what's the oh, Glasgow is home, so everything's better there. But uh, 
I would have to say the plants I've seen here in the Northwest, I've collected over almost 500 specimens of plants that can be eaten, plants that can be made into dye stuffs, uh, plants that can be used for medicine, plants that can be used for clothing. Uh, it's an amazing variety of plants that grow here in the Northwest. So I would say from a useful point of view, the plants that are here are probably much better than those that we have back in Glasgow. That's good to hear. Now it says to ask Chad, about the um, plants. What was the name of the plant that could be used to make light tea? Light tea. Uh, there are a number of plants that can be used to make tea. I don't remember from my talk which one he's referring to. Uh, you can make tea from the raspberry leaves. You can make it from the rose leaves. Although we didn't see any roses on this particular walk. Uh, you can make it from uh, elderberry flowers, makes a very good light tea, uh, but I'm not sure exactly what plant you might be referring to. Uh, and there's another question about, uh, discuss the plants used to make mats to cover the houses of the Indian people. Yeah. Uh, their lodges were covered with a, a couple of things. Uh, Usually a bachelor lodge uh, simply used high covers of some sort and wasn't very large. The larger ones were made out of either tule mats or uh, sometimes cattail stalks. And they would collect those in great numbers using obsidian knives and then they would be bundled and dried. And as they became more and more dry, they were woven together uh, using either a dog bane or nettle twine or something of that sort into large mats. Then the mats were placed over a frame, uh, sometimes willows, sometimes other wood, and they were layered over each other like we would shingle a house. And by doing that, uh, when it rained, the rain was forced to follow the grooves uh, in the mat and then overlapped each other and went off. Usually on the top of the lodge, there was an opening. Rather than building a chimney, there was just an opening. And you would have a, either one or several fires uh, in the base of the lodge and when those fires became smoky, that smoke would rise and go out through the top of the lodge. Uh, the nice thing about them is that they're very light. Uh, they can be rolled up. They can be put on a travoy on the back of a horse, or they could be carried uh, long distances and used again and again until they had to be replaced. And uh, can you explain how you identify plants that you've never seen before arriving here in the Northwest? Well, Linnaeus is a good friend. <laughs> uh, I carried his book and uh, most of the time I could get within a family or, or something a little narrower than that. Uh, many times the plants had never been seen before or certainly not by someone who could identify them. And so I'd have to take a good guess at it. Um, the camas was one of those that I found very interesting because not only was there camas, there was death camas. And people had told me about both and I assume naturally that they were very similar, probably in the same genus. As it turns out, they're, they're barely related, but they do look similar. And uh, one of them is highly poisonous. The other one is highly edible. So I took my best guess on some of those. And when we got the specimens back to Glasgow, then I had the London Horticultural Society and eventually the Royal Horticultural Society and other uh, more senior botanists take a look at it and they would end up uh, classifying it, naming it. I'm, I won't say that I'm a modest man, but I, I don't feel comfortable naming plants after myself. And you might have noticed that there are a, a lot of plants named for me, uh, David Douglas. Uh, but the problem was that when the more senior botanists found those, uh, they honored me with naming them that way. The interesting thing though is that if you take a look at Douglas fir, the tree that I'm probably most famous for, uh, it doesn't have my name in it anywhere. It's uh, Sudasuga menzii, after another great botanist who came on a ship, saw the Douglas fir for the first time uh, down in California, and it was named for him. Uh, but I was the one that successfully brought seeds back to England, and now there are David Douglas trees all over England. And so the name kind of stuck with me, even though I didn't really uh, see it for the very first time. 
Okay, here's one from the chat. How did you interact? Did a, uh, he's a funny that? man. Uh, how did a squirrel get my name? Same way that the lizard got my name. Ranasima Douglasi. <laughs> you you want to answer that question, Gruber? Well, I get it there that you want to answer. Uh, the bottom line is that uh, not only did I take back botanical specimens, I took back quite a few zoological specimens as well. Uh, uh, how did you interact with the local tribes to get information about their uses of the plants? Okay, uh, I was reading another one. Tell, ask me that again. Uh, how did you interact with the local tribes to get info on how they use the plants? Oh, uh, quite well, although it got off to a rough start. Uh, I met the chief of the uh, Chinooks and I got to know him quite well and would visit with him and have meals with him. And one day he said to me, he said, King George Man, that's what he called me. He, we were King George Man, Englishman. And he said, King George Man, uh, you're a bad man. And I thought, uh-oh, and what did I do to offend him? And I said, what, what did I do, chief? Explain it to me. He said, I talked to my people and they said, you a bad man. And I said, well, I'm, I didn't mean it. <laughs> what did I do? What, what did I do? And he said, you do three things, King Judge Man. Three things make you bad man. I said, well, what are they, Chief? And he said, first thing, you make fire with burning glass. And he's right, I do. Uh, although the sun doesn't always shine here in the Northwest, I carry a burning glass. Got the name Ali Pisca from doing that. And wherever I could, instead of using uh, flint and steel, I'd start my fire with a burning glass. Second thing he said, he said, we watch you drink boiling water right from the fire. Well, it was true. Uh, I noticed they did most of their boiling in baskets and in cedar boxes. And yet I would take a metal uh, cup of water and put it in the fire until it boiled. And I put my tea in it. I love hot tea. And when the tea was ready, I'd lift it out and let it cool a little bit, but it was still bubbling. And when I drank it, uh, they thought I was drinking red hot fire. And, uh, they said, that's a bad thing. Only an evil spirit could do that. And I explained to them what I was doing. But the last one, this one really got to me because I was sitting there looking at the chief and at the time I was wearing my eyeglasses. I'm not wearing them now because I, I can't see close up with them on, but I was wearing my eyeglasses. And the chief said to me, you wear those on your eyes. And he was right, I do. And sometimes I even wore purple ones. Uh, it was a a uh, doctor back in Glasgow that made them for me. And my eyes were getting worse and worse. And he made me a pair of uh, purple ones that he said would help block out the bad rays of the sun. Only problem is when I wore them, I couldn't find my plants. They all looked alike. So, but I did need these glasses. And the chief said, you, you wear those. And I said, chief, do you know why I wear these? And he said, because you're a bad man. And I said, no, I have difficulty seeing. I said, here, chief, try them on. And he chief put him on and he did what most of the natives did in those days. He was astonished. He went and he could see better. And when he could see a long distance like that, he was impressed. After that, he went and told his people that I wasn't a bad man, but we did get off to a rocky start. But after we did get off to that rocky start, uh, I proved that I was a good shot. I did different contests with them and, uh, I would explain to them how to raise some of these plants. I had a, I had a quite of an interesting situation. Uh, I was sitting at the mouth of the uh, uh, Willamette River and an Indian came up the path and I noticed he had a bundle of native tobacco under his arm. Now, I hadn't seen any yet here in the Northwest and I was impressed. I thought, well, how does this stuff grow around here? It usually needs some cultivation and care. So I asked him. In fact, I even asked him if he would trade with me. I had some manufactured tobacco from the fort and I was willing to trade it for what he had and he wouldn't do it. So I waited till he went down the trail quite a ways and I walked into the woods to see where he might have got it and I found a beautiful open area. It looked like it had been burned off and there was native tobacco growing in there. Well, I took a few specimens like I'm prone to do with plants and as I started up the trail, here he came. And he looked at me and he looked at the bundle of tobacco and I had a lot of explaining to do. And we sat down, I offered him some uh, manufactured tobacco. We, we talked for a little bit in sign language and 
he explained to me that he was the one that burned the area off, planted the seeds, brought the water to them, cultivated them, and used them in his religious ceremonies. And I was quite impressed. It was the first time that I had heard of any Native Americans that were doing actual cultivation on things like tobacco here in the Northwest. So that's another example of, of how I got to learn what they did and how they did with the things that they had here. Uh, I could go on and on all day, but I won't. And I think you see that, that other question about... Uh, how long did I spend here? Well, yeah, I, how long did you spend in the Northwest? Uh, did you have an assistant? What did you do with all the knowledge and specimens that you collected? Uh, and well, were, were some of your plants introduced to Kew Gardens or the Crystal Palace exhibit? Yes, uh, that, that last question is just yes. Uh, there were a number of plants that were, um, I don't have time to list them, but uh, there were a number of plants that I brought back that are still growing in Kew Garden. Uh, a very interesting place to do. Uh, we go back to the questions again. They're not on. on uh, yeah. How long did you spend here and did you have an assistant? How long? I arrived here in April of 1825 after a nine month journey from England and uh, they were just building for Vancouver. And so I got to spend some time there. Well, I was supposed to spend just one year in the country. Uh, but when I got back to the uh, camp in September, uh, I accidentally drove a nail into my knee. Uh, I was packing things up to specimens to send back to uh, England, and I tripped, and when I fell, I landed on a nail, went into my knee. Uh, it started to infect. It was nasty. And uh, if you can't stand, a nine-month sea voyage is unbearable. So I decided that I would just stay for another year because it was that long before the ships came back. So I stayed another year, and then I heard about that, pond, that uh, sugar pine. So by the time I got back, it was October, uh, almost November, and I missed the boat again. So I decided I'd stay for another year. Well, uh, Dr. McLaughlin told me about the uh, Hudson Bay Express, uh, where they leave Fort Vancouver, they go up through Canada, they go to the western shores of uh, uh, Hudson's Bay, and catch a ship there and go home. And I thought, well, that would be a lot faster than spending nine months going back around. So that's what I did. So when you ask how long I spent here, a lot longer than I had in mind to, uh, from April, and I arrived back home in September of 1827. But I came back, uh, went to Hawaii. I, I did a little more hiking the second trip over here. Uh, I went up in 1829, went up into uh, Canada, was thinking maybe I could cross from Alaska to uh, China or Russia or something and uh, didn't quite make it that far and went to Hawaii instead. Mm -hmm. I liked Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Must have been nice. Uh, I see a couple of other questions here. Um, let's see, what, what plants are important to making buckskin used in clothing and other items? I'm, I'm assuming that you're talking about vegetable tanning although most of the, the locals preferred brain tanning. Uh, there are a number of plants that can be used. Uh, you use the bark of uh, the, the native oak, the Gary Oak, uh, which by the way, isn't named after me, but I named it after a friend in the Hudson's Bay Company. Uh, Gary Oak, uh, the bark has a lot of tannin in it and can be used to uh, vegetably process the hides. Once the hides are tanned, uh, they can also be smoked. Uh, willow smoke gives you a beautiful brown color. Uh, depending on the type of wood you use, uh, you can use uh, some of the wood material itself to smoke and, and color your hides. Uh, not only that, but you can also use some of the uh, uh, nuts, filberts, and others uh, to, to make dyes, to uh, dye some of your uh, buckskins from white to uh, odd colors that you might want. And another, uh, did Indian people in the Walla Walla region ever burn vegetation to manage plant growth or modify environment? Every year. Uh, I even have a record, like I said, I got a copy of Lewis and Clark's journals. Uh, I thought it would be a good place to start. Captain Lewis was noted for some of his botanical discoveries and that was a good place to uh, make reference. And as I went around the area, I would frequently read what he wrote about some of the things that were here. And uh, he, he developed the idea that many of the plants that he found here 
were used by the Native Americans for a variety of reasons. And he was quite explicit about uh, describing them and talking about them. Is that what you wanted to know? Yeah. Okay. I think so. Well, it looks like uh, that's, that's the questions. Uh, and also, you might find it interesting, uh, a friend of yours, David Douglas, a friend of yours, Gary Lentz, was awarded an award named after you, the David Douglas Award from the Washington State Historical Society. Uh, for the number of plants about, that he... What's that? The number of plants that he could consume at one setting or what? Well, I, I, that may, may not have been part of that, but uh, he helped work to create a Lewis and Clark map of them, their travels in Walla Walla. And two very good assistants, one who has recently passed away and another one he still works with. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. And well, and thanks to everybody for asking questions. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I'm sure I'll get asked these when I get back to England and uh, might as well have Americans ask me. They're a lot easier audience than the English. Okay, well, yeah, thank you everybody for coming and keep an eye out for more events from Fort Walla Walla Museum. Uh, keep an eye on our website and Facebook and come visit us as we open uh, for weekends tomorrow. So everybody have a good day.